All right, today we're going to move forward into chapter four of um, the Narnia, or Prince Caspian story. Um, I just want to remind you kind of where we are in the story. So yesterday, the Pevensey children, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, they now know that they are in Narnia, and they came across two soldiers trying to execute this dwarf. They were able to save the dwarf's life, and now they're asking him questions, trying to figure out what is going on, why are they here, what is, why has the land changed so much, what is going on since they've been gone, etc. So um, the dwarf is trying to explain to them uh, piece by piece what's happening, but he finally says, you know what, hold on, let me just go back to the beginning. So you have to understand that this is the this whole chapter, chapter four, is the dwarf retelling the story of the last hundred or couple of years leading up to where they are today. So it's kind of like he's trying to give the, the four children a history lesson. So that's kind of the, the idea of chapter four. Just keep in mind that this is the dwarf um, giving the history of what's happened so far. Chapter four, the dwarf tells of Prince Caspian. Prince Caspian lived in a great castle in the center of Narnia with his uncle, Miraz, the king of Narnia, and his aunt, who had red hair and was called Queen Prunaprismia. His father and mother were dead, and the person whom Caspian loved best was his nurse. And though, being a prince, he had wonderful toys which would do almost anything but talk, he liked best the last hour of the day when the toys had all been put back in their cupboards and nurse would tell him stories. Okay, so you have to understand his nurse is really more like um, his, he kind of acts as his tutor, his babysitter, his doc, his uh, school teacher, kind of all of the above. He did not care much for his uncle and aunt, but about twice a week his uncle would send for him and they would walk up and down together for half an hour on the terrace at the south side of the castle. One day while they were doing this, the king said to him, Well, boy. We must soon teach you how to ride and use a sword. You know that your aunt and I have no children, so it looks as if you might have to be king when I'm gone. How shall you like that, eh? Oh, I don't know, uncle, said Caspian. Don't know, eh, said Miraz. Why, I should like to know what more anyone could wish for. All the same, I do wish, said Caspian. So note, Caspian doesn't seem to be too excited about becoming king one day. Fine, well, what do you wish? asked the king. I wish, I wish, I wish I could have lived in the old days, said Caspian. He was only a very little boy at the time. Up till now, King Miraz had been talking in the tiresome way that some grown-ups have, which makes it quite clear that they're not really interested in what they're saying. But now, he suddenly gave Caspian a very sharp look. Huh? What's that? he said. What old days do you mean? Oh, don't you know, uncle, said Caspian, when everything was quite different, when all the animals could talk, and there were nice people who lived in the streams and the trees. Naiads and dryads, they were called. Oh, and there were dwarfs, and there were lovely little fawns in all the woods. They had feet like goats, and that's all nonsense for babies, said the king sternly. Only fit for babies, do you hear? You're getting too old for that sort of stuff. At your age, you ought to be thinking of battles and adventures, not fairy tales. Oh, but there were battles and adventures in those days, said Caspian. Wonderful adventures. Once there was a white witch, and she made herself queen of the whole country. And she made it so that it was always winter. And then two boys and two girls came from somewhere, and so they killed the witch. And they were made kings and queens of Narnia. And their names were Peter and Susan and Edmund and Lucy. And so they reigned for ever so long, and everyone had a lovely time, and it was all because of Aslan. Who's he? said Miraz. And if Caspian had been a very little older, the tone of his uncle's voice would have warned him that it would be wiser to shut up. But he babbled on. Oh, don't you know, he said, Aslan is the great lion who comes from over the sea. Who has been telling you all this nonsense? 
said the king in a voice of thunder. Caspian was frightened and said nothing. Your royal highness, said King Miraz, letting go of Caspian's hand, which he had been holding up until now. I insist upon being answered. Look me in the face. Who has been telling you this pack of lies? N nurse, faltered Caspian and burst into tears. Stop that noise, said his uncle, taking Caspian by the shoulders and giving him a shake. Stop it and never let me catch you talking or thinking either about all those silly stories again. There never were those kings and queens. How could there be two kings at the same time? And there's no such person as Aslan. And there are no such things as lions. And there never was a time when animals could talk. Do you hear? Yes, uncle, sobbed Caspian. Then let's have no more of it, said the king. Then he called to one of the gentlemen in waiting who were standing at the far end of the terrace and said in a cold voice, Conduct his royal highness to his apartments and send his royal highness's nurse to me at once. The next day, Caspian found what a terrible thing he had done, for nurse had been sent away without even being allowed to say goodbye to him. And he was told he was now to have a tutor. Okay, so what happened here? The nurse, or Caspian's nurse, had been telling him the stories of, the, tr the true stories of Narnia of old. But for some reason, King Miraz does not want Caspian to grow up knowing these stories. He doesn't want him to believe in them. He doesn't want him to even know about them. So Caspian gets in trouble for talking about it. And he says, I never want to hear you talk about this ever again. Then he, he, so he sends uh, Caspian away for the night. Then he calls up his nurse and says, basically, you're fired because you've been telling these pack of lies to my, whoa, to my um, son or to my nephew. Absolutely, you should be doing that. So, she, so the nurse got fired and now he was supposed to have a tutor instead. Caspian missed his nurse very much and shed many tears because he was so miserable. He thought about the old stories, oh, and because he was so miserable, sorry, he thought about the old stories of Narnia far more than before. He dreamed of dwarfs and dryads every night and tried very hard to make the dogs and cats from the castle talk to him, but the dogs only wagged their tails and the cats only purred. Caspian felt sure that he would hate the new tutor, but when the new tutor arrived about a week later, he turned out to be the sort of person it is almost impossible not to like. He was the smallest and also the fattest man Caspian had ever seen. He had a long, silvery, pointed beard which came down to his waist, and his face, which was brown and covered with wrinkles, looked very wise, very ugly, and very kind. His voice was grave and his eyes were merry so that, until you got to know him really well, it was hard to know when he was joking and when he was serious. His name was Dr. Cornelius. Of all his lessons with Dr. Cornelius, the one that Caspian liked best was history. Up till now, except for Nurse's stories, he had known nothing about the history of Narnia, and he was very surprised to learn that the royal family were newcomers in the country. It was your highness's ancestor, Caspian I, said Dr. Cornelius, who first conquered Narnia and made it his kingdom. It was he who brought all your nation into the country. You are not native Narnians at all. You are all Telmarines. That is, you all came from the land of Telmar, far beyond the western mountains. That is why Caspian I is called Caspian the Conqueror. Okay, so what the what Dr. Cornelius is telling him is that he um, was not originally, his people, okay, so his people group, the Telmarines, were not the ones who lived in Narnia first. They actually had come in and conquered another people group or tribe that had lived there before, okay, which we know was the old Narnians, the dwarf, the fawns, um, when Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy were kings and queens, okay? But apparently, Caspian's ancestor, who was Caspian I, also known as Caspian the Conqueror, 
He was the one that led the Telmarines into the land and conquered old Narnia and took it over. Please, Doctor, asked Castian one day. Tell me, who lived in Narnia before we all came here out of Telmar? Well, no men, or very few, lived in Narnia before the Telmarines took it, said Dr. Cornelius. Okay, well then, who did my great great grandsisters conquer? Whom, not who, your highness, said Dr. Cornelius. Perhaps it is time to turn from history to grammar. Oh no, please, not yet, said Caspian. I mean, wasn't there a battle? Why is he called Caspian the Conqueror if there was nobody here to fight with him? I said there were very few men in Narnia, said the doctor, looking at the little boy very strangely through his great spectacles. For a moment, Caspian was puzzled, and then suddenly his heart gave a leap. <gasps> Do you mean, he gasped, that there were other things? Do you mean it was like in the stories? Were there? Shh, said Dr. Cornelius, laying his head very close to Caspian's. Not a word more. Don't you know your nurse was sent away for telling you about old Narnia? The king doesn't like it. If he found me telling you secrets, you'd be whipped and I should have my head cut off. But why? asked Caspian. It is high time we turn to grammar now, said Dr. Cornelius in a loud voice. Will your royal highness be pleased to open pulverulentus sicus to the fourth page of his grammatical garden of the arbor of accidents, pleasantile open to tender wits? Hey, I want to pause for a second. Why does Dr. Cornelius say this in a loud voice? Okay, because he's just in case anyone overhears them, he doesn't want them to hear Caspian and Dr. Cornelius talking about old Narnia. So he's kind of, you know, it's, it's almost like you're trying to hide something. You know, you say, uh, we're turning to grammar now. Um, Royal Highness, will you please open to blah, 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 trying to get things back on track and hide the fact that they were just talking about things that the king had forbidden. Well, after that, it was all nouns and verbs until lunchtime. But I don't think Caspian learned much. He was too excited. He felt sure that Dr. Cornelius would not have said so much unless he meant to tell him more sooner or later. And in this, he was not disappointed. A few days later, his tutor said, Tonight, I am going to give you a lesson in astronomy. At the dead of night, so in the middle of the night, Two noble planets, Tava and Alambil, will pass within one degree of each other. Such a conjunction has not occurred for two hundred years, and your highness will not live to see it again. It will be best if you go to bed a little earlier than usual. When the time of the conjunction draws near, I will come and wake you. Well, this didn't seem to have anything to do with old Narnia, which is what Caspian really wanted to hear about, but... Getting up in the middle of the night is always interesting, and he was moderately pleased. When he went to bed that night, he had thought at first that he would not be able to sleep, but he soon dropped off, and it seemed only a few minutes before he felt someone gently shaking him. He sat up in bed and saw that the room was full of moonlight. Dr. Cornelius, muffled in a hooded robe and holding a small lamp in his hand, stood by the bedside. Caspian remembered at once what they were going to do. He got up and put on some clothes. Although it was a summer night, he felt colder than he had expected and was quite glad when the doctor wrapped him in a robe like his own and gave him a pair of warm, soft buskins for his feet. A moment later, both muffled so that they could hardly be seen in the dark corridors and both shod so that they almost made no noise, master and pupil left the room. Now, this is interesting. It's almost like the author is trying to um, foreshadow or hint at something. They take great care to say that they could hardly be seen in the hallways as they're walking outside the castle to view the stars. And they're both shod or dressed so that they made almost no noise. So you can almost not see them and you can almost not hear them as they exit the castle. I wonder why the author took great care in saying that. 
we'll have to wait and see. Caspian followed the doctor through many passages and up several staircases, and at last, through a little door in a turret, turret, they came out upon the leaves. On one side were the battlements, on the other a steep roof. Below them, all shadowy and shimmery, the castle gardens. Above them, stars and moon. Presently they came to another door, which led into the great central tower of the whole castle. Dr. Cornelius unlocked it, and they began to climb the dark, winding stair of the tower. Casting was becoming excited. He had never been allowed up this stair before. It was long and steep, but when they came out on the roof of the tower and Caspian had got his breath, he felt that it had been well worth it. Away on his right he could see, rather indistinctly, the western mountains. On his left was the gleam of the great river, and everything was so quiet that he could hear the sound of the waterfall at Beaver's Dam a mile away. There was no difficulty in picking out the two stars that they had come to see. They hung rather low in the southern sky, almost as bright as two little moons and very close together. Are they going to have a collision? he asked in an awestruck voice. Nay, dear prince, said the doctor, and he too spoke in a whisper. The great lords of the upper sky know the steps of their dance far too well for that. Look well upon them. Their meeting is fortunate, and means some great good for the sad realm of Narnia. Tava, the lord of victory, salutes Alambil, the lady of peace. They are just coming to the nearest. It's a pity that tree gets in the way, said Caspian. We'd really see better from the west tower, though it is not so high. Dr. Cornelius said nothing for about two minutes, but stood still with his eyes fixed on Tarva and Alambil. Then he drew a deep breath and turned to Caspian. <sighs> there, he said. You have seen what no man now alive has seen, nor will see again. And you are right. We should have seen it even better from the smaller tower. But I brought you here for another reason. Caspian looked up at him, but the doctor's hood concealed most of his face. The virtue of this tower, said Dr. Cornelius, is that we have six empty rooms beneath us, and a long stair, and the door at the bottom of the stair is locked. We cannot be overheard. So, why did Dr. Cornelius pick this tower, as opposed to the west tower, if they could have seen better from the west tower? Well, this tower has an advantage because there are six empty rooms below them, excuse me, a long staircase, and then this door at the bottom of the stair is locked, so no one is going to overhear them. Apparently, Dr. Cornelius is going to tell him something that he wants no one else to hear. <gasps> are you going to tell me what you wouldn't tell me the other day? said Caspian. I am, said the doctor, but remember... You and I must never talk about these things except here, on the very top of the great tower. No, that's a promise, said Caspian. But do go on, please. Listen, said the doctor. All you have heard about old Narnia is true. It is not the land of men. It is the country of Aslan, the country of the waking trees and visible naiads, of fauns and satyrs, of dwarfs and giants, of the gods and the centaurs, of talking beasts. It was against these that the first Caspian fought. It is you, Telmarines, who silenced the beasts and the trees and the fountains, and who killed and drove away the dwarfs and fauns, and are now trying to cover up even the memory of them. The king does not even allow them to be spoken of. Oh, I do wish we hadn't conquered them, said Caspian. And I am glad it was all true, even if it is all over. Many of your race wish that in secret, said Dr. Cornelius. Why does he say your race wishes that in secret? Well, Caspian can't be a Telmarine that openly wishes the Telmarines had lost the battle. That would be like a traitor. Doctor, said Caspian, why do you say my race? After all, I suppose you are a Telmarine too. 
Am I? said the doctor. Well, you're a man, anyway, said Caspian. Am I? repeated the doctor in a deeper voice, at the same moment throwing back his hood so that Caspian could see his face clearly in the moonlight. All at once, Caspian realized the truth and felt that he ought to have realized it long before. Dr. Cornelius was so small and so fat and had such a very long beard. Two thoughts came into his head at the same moment. One was a thought of terror. He's not a real man, not a man at all. He's a dwarf. Oh, and he's brought me up here to kill me. The other thought was sheer delight. They're all real dwarfs still, and I've seen one at last. So you've guessed it in the end, said Dr. Cornelius, or guessed it nearly right. I'm not a pure dwarf. I have human blood in me too. Many dwarfs escaped in the great battles and lived on, shaving their beards and wearing high-heeled shoes and pretending to be men. They have since mixed with your telmarines. I am one of those only a half-dwarf, and if any of my kindred, the true dwarfs, are still alive anywhere in the world, doubtless they would despise me and call me a traitor. But never in all these years have we forgotten our own people and all the other happy creatures of Narnia and the long lost days of freedom. Okay, so Caspian has just figured out that Dr. Cornelius is in fact a dwarf, but he's not a full dwarf. He's a half dwarf, a dwarf that has kind of mixed in with the Telmarines, okay? And he says there are other dwarfs out there that exist, but they have to live in hiding because if they're found, King Miraz will have them killed or punished, okay? And he says if any true dwarfs found out that I was a half dwarf, they would be so mad at me because they would consider me a traitor for... A, being a half-dwarf, and then B, working with the Telmarines. I, I'm so sorry, Doctor, said Caspian. It wasn't my fault, you know. What is he apologizing for? He's apologizing for his people having killed and uh, driven off the dwarfs way back when. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not saying these things in blame of you, dear Prince, answered the Doctor. You may well ask why I say them at all, but I have two reasons. Firstly, because my old heart has carried these secret memories so long that it aches with them and would burst if I did not whisper them to you. But secondly, for this, that when you become king, you may help us, for I know that you also, Telmarine though you are, love the old things. Oh, I do, I do, said Caspian, but how can I help? Well, when you're king, you can be kind to the poor remnants of the dwarf people like myself. You can gather learned magicians and try to find a way of awaking the trees once more. Oh, that's an, another important thing here. Um, old Narnia, not the Narnia of old, the trees ha were living, basically. You'll see later in the book, Lucy talks about the spirit of the trees and how the trees used to sing and dance and they were just gorgeous and beautiful and would uh, kind of contribute to nature a little more. But when the Telmarines came and conquered, the talking animals w ran away to hide. And then the trees, th the book says they shrunk back into themselves. So basically, the magic of the trees went away. And now they're just like any old tree that you would normally see on Earth. They were no longer magical or special. So he says you can uh, be nice to the rest of the door, door people. You can try and awake the trees. You can search through all the nooks and wild places of the land to see if any fawns or talking beasts or dwarfs are perhaps still alive and in hiding. <gasps> Do you think there are any? asked Caspian eagerly. I don't know. I really don't know, said the doctor with a deep sigh. Sometimes I am afraid there can't be. I have been looking for traces of them all my life. Sometimes I have thought I heard a dwarf drum in the mountains. Sometimes at night in the woods, I thought I had caught a glimpse of fawns and satyrs dancing a long way off, but when I came to the place, there was never anything there. I have often despaired, but something always happens to stop me hoping again. I don't know, but 
At least you can try to be a king like the High King Peter of old, and not like your uncle. Wait, then it's true about the kings and queens too? And about the White Witch? said Caspian. Certainly it is true, said Cornelius. Their reign was the golden age in Narnia, and the land has never forgotten them. Did they live in, the, in this castle, Doctor? Oh, nay, my dear, said the old man. This castle is a thing of yesterday, meaning it was just built recently. Your great-great-grandfather built it. But when the two sons of Adam and the two daughters of Eve were made kings and queens of Narnia by Aslan himself, they lived in the castle of Caerpervel. No man alive has seen that blessed place, and perhaps even the ruins of it have now vanished. Side note, he's wrong. But, once again, no one knows where the ruins of Caerpervel are. But... We do believe it was far from here, down at the mouth of the great river on the very shore of the sea. Oh, said Caspian with a shudder, do you mean in the black woods? Where all the, the, well, you know, the ghosts live? <laughs> Your Highness speaks as you have been taught, said the doctor, but it is all lies. There are no ghosts in there. That is a story invented by the Telmarines. Your kings are in deadly fear of the sea because they can never quite forget that in all the stories, Aslan comes from over the sea. They don't even want to go near it, and they don't want anyone else to go near it either. So they have let great woods grow up to cut their people off from the coast. But because they have quarreled with the trees, they are afraid of the woods. And because they are afraid of the woods, they imagine that they are full of ghosts. And the kings and great men, hating both the sea and the wood, partly even believe these stories and partly encourage them. They feel safer if no one in Narnia dares to go down to the coast and look out to the sea, towards Aslan's land and the morning in the eastern end of the world. There was a deep silence between them for a few minutes. Then Dr. Cornelius said, Come. We have been here long enough. It is time to go down and to bed. Oh, must we? said Caspian. I'd like to go on talking about these things for hours and hours and hours. Well, someone might begin looking for us if we did that, said Dr. Cornelius. And then tomorrow we'll pick up from there and see what happens after Caspian discovers that Narnia of old really was a true thing. But I do want to explain real quick why um, the Telmarines are afraid of the woods, as, Cas as Dr. Cornelius explained. Why they're afraid of the woods. They're not necessarily, well, they're, they've been brought up and taught that the woods are full of ghosts so that no one will go there. But they're not actually full of ghosts. The point is, King Miraz and all the Telmarine kings before him, they're more afraid of the sea because that is where Aslan comes from. So in order to keep their people away from the sea and away from Aslan's country, so, so to speak, they have, have led their people to believe that those woods are haunted, which is why the soldiers freaked out when Susan shot an arrow from the woods to save the dwarf. So tomorrow we'll pick up there, or not tomorrow, Mon Tuesday actually, um, we'll pick up there and we'll see what happens with Caspian's adventure in the mountains.